uh, we're really keen to have this, this, this Zoom event because it's, um, and what prompted it, of course, is the, the 50th anniversary of the founding of the United Form Church. But of course, it's the fact that it's our jubilee year that prompted some, some deeper reflection on, on what the meaning uh, of jubilee uh, is. And, and, and of course, it was originally about debt forgiveness. And so we thought, who better than to, to speak about uh, debt uh, and, the, and the work that they're doing than Global Justice Now? Daniel uh, is, is, is one of the um, absolutely fabulous campaigners, and um, I'm sure he's going to tell us a little bit more about um, what he does in, the, uh, in a minute uh, before I hand to him. But just in terms of this session, we want to keep it to, to under an hour. I'm going to ask Daniel to start, if he wouldn't mind, just talking uh, about what um, his, uh, the work that they're doing at Global Justice now. Uh, that we're so delighted with uh, uh, as Commitment for Life. We, we really do support them and, and wish them um, every success. Um, we probably, I'm not too sure how long Daniel will take, around about 20 minutes or so, 15, 20 minutes, and we'll leave a little time for, for discussion. And then in my section, I'm going to do a little bit of, of uh, talking around some of the, the origins of debt and the theology that we begin to work on, 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 on that, that surrounds the question of debt, uh, which what may take us into some, some more theoretical positions around them. Uh, just to say that Richard is, in fact, an economist. So if you have any e e kind of global economic type questions, I will refer them to Richard. So without any further ado, Daniel, I'm going to hand over to you. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, yeah, so my name is Daniel Willis. Uh, I work as a, a campaigner on uh, kind of a broad range of uh, financial justice issues, including debt cancellation with Global Justice Now. Um, and yeah, we, we've kind of campaigned uh, for a while on, on the issue of debt, um, but not always super consistently. Um, I guess for context, uh, people may remember that there was a, a big wave of support behind uh, debt cancellation in the kind of uh, last stages of the millennium, uh, the Jubilee 2000 movement, which saw a, a lot of debt cancellation in the new labor period. Uh, and then sort of pieces of legislation right at the end of the Brown government uh, a little over 10 years ago that saw a certain amount of uh, debt cancelled for uh, lower income countries. Uh, and that was heralded as being quite a key moment. Uh, you know, the legislation was passed in the UK and it was quite a big win for the, for the movement. Um, and, and that had sort of come off uh, you know, after uh, kind of anti-poverty campaigns in the years before. Um, so unfortunately, the, the case after that is that although uh, that kind of piece of legislation uh, known as HIPIC uh, did reduce the debt burden that a lot of countries are facing, uh, it, it sort of failed to deal with some of the structural issues to do with debt and sort of wider financing problems that a lot of governments in the global south have. Um, and the basic impact in a lot of cases was that, uh, yes, governments were able to, to reduce their debt, but they still didn't have the finance to, to spend on infrastructure, uh, long-term investment in public services. And so as the decade progressed, uh, particularly kind of, the past five or seven years, uh, which is a period when uh, commodity prices have fallen and uh, a lot of countries have faced kind of economic recessions. More and more countries are turning to the debt market to try and sort of finance that, those types of investments, which means their debt burdens have, have risen again. Um, and in that period, sort of a kind of uh, lesser remarked uh, trend, I suppose, that, but one that was quite apparent by uh, roughly the start of the pandemic was that while uh, that legislation had cancelled debt between governments, quite often now it's uh, private lenders and banks and asset managers uh, that have stepped in to, uh, to lend uh, developing government, governments in developing countries money. Um, and it's become a particularly attractive prospect for those banks because uh, they can charge higher interest rates to developing countries uh, because uh, it's sort of seen as the cost of doing business in, in riskier environments uh, where the kind of the rate the, uh, the rate of profit that they're likely to get is perhaps not guaranteed and so for uh, perhaps counterintuitively they can guarantee their profits through higher interest rates uh, and that's significant uh, what which I'll highlight why exactly later um, but we've, we've not been a huge amount of work on debt in that period. This is sort of taken back to roughly about two years ago to the start of the pandemic. 
Um, but obviously what happened at that point, uh, talking about kind of April, May 2020, uh, was that the sort of spread of COVID-19 across the world quite quickly had a big impact on the, the finances of governments in the global south. Uh, there's a huge drop off in international trade. Um, <clears throat> you know, already then there were kind of uh, obviously big kind of supply chain issues uh, and, you know, lockdowns and other things uh, really pushed governments who were already quite close to being in debt crisis over the edge to then facing much sort of stronger difficulties uh, in sort of repaying those loans. Um, and th th there was a response from the international community. Um, uh, internationally, a lot of our partners uh, and organizations like ourselves who've kind of done bits of work on debt in the past but weren't currently engaged in it kind of restarted our campaigns. Um, and yeah, in the UK, we, we work closely with Jubilee Debt Campaign, uh, who've now changed their name to Debt Justice. Um, some faith-based organizations like Christine Aid and Cathod uh, and Oxfam and, and other organizations kind of uh, regrouped to form a bit of a, a coalition, which is who we've, we've done this work with. Um, and that initially started by, by kind of lobbying uh, some of the bigger governments in the G20 and the G7 to suspend uh, the debts that they were, the debt payments that were going to them. Um, and that, that did happen uh, towards the end of 2020. Um, so we had a situation where actually governments, again, were quite willing to put forward some measures to kind of uh, to ease the debt burden in the global south. Uh, but again, as with kind of HIPIC previously, they, were not, uh, they, they weren't really comprehensive enough to, to solve a problem. Uh, and particularly with, with this new measure that the G20 in, uh, created, uh, it only applied to, again, uh, loans between governments. So it didn't actually cover those those private creditors and the banks who kind of stepped into a lot of uh, debt relationships uh, in the global south in the intervening years, um, and and also countries have to apply for debt relief um, through this system. Uh, and although that might not sound like a huge obstacle, uh, countries are often very unwilling to voluntarily apply for debt relief because. Um, credit ratings agencies will take a fairly dim view of that. Uh, it's sort of taken as evidence that governments can't finance their own expenses. Uh, and it raises the prospect that in future, organizations like the IMF, the World Bank, um, or all the banks and other creditors, again, might just refuse to give loans altogether. Um, so there's, it kind of creates this cycle of, of debt creating an initial crisis, but also a kind of a long-term problem for governments in terms of uh, it potentially leading to public sector cuts, which we saw a lot uh, across many countries during the pandemic, uh, and also this kind of uh, this fear of not being able to raise further money uh, in the future. Uh, so, so that was quite an insufficient kind of reform put in place by, um, by the G20. Um, so a little over a year ago, we, we sort of changed tack slightly with our campaign. We thought the, the thing that we really need to do is to raise the issue of, of the profits that these banks are making still in the pandemic. Um, there'd been a kind of very moral and ethical call from those governments to, to say, you know, this is a pandemic. We can't justify uh, rich governments making profits from loans throughout this when the whole world's in crisis. Um, but the banks, unfortunately, didn't take the, the same view. Um, and that was despite uh, calls from the heads of a lot of these international institutions like the UN, uh, the International Monetary Fund. Uh, they were saying there is a moral case and, a, uh, and an economic case, actually, for the, for the banks to suspend payments now. Um, and, and the Pope joined those calls, uh, but, but still they were, they were resisting, um, resisting basically uh, suspending even any debts and certainly not cancelling them. So, uh, so we started our campaign. First, we focused on uh, HSBC uh, as a creditor that was making a, quite a bit of money in, in various countries. Uh, the countries that we identified were Ghana, uh, Nigeria, uh, Zambia, and I think Senegal, uh, and Kenya as well, uh, where these banks had quite a high proportion of, of the debt. Um, but it wasn't really being connected in the media. So we, we set up a petition, uh, where as support of the writing to the, to the heads of HSBC, uh, we, we held a kind of demonstration and a bit of a protest outside HSBC's AGM. 
and some of our supporters, uh, we we have HSBC shares to do kind of shareholder activism. So some of our supporters went in and, and put these questions to the board. And that got a, a fair amount of press coverage uh, last year. Um, but but still, really, we, <laughs> although we were sort of able to draw a bit more attention to it, um, I think one thing we found was that um, still there's not a huge amount of pressure on these banks to actually act. A lot of the power does sit with governments, and particularly with the UK and the US government, because a lot of these contracts for the debts are, are written up in, in London and New York. Uh, so what we really need to do is kind of increase the pressure on these creditors in specific situations and ask those, uh, the kind of legislators in those places for specific kind of uh, conditions to, to be attached to these uh, negotiations. Um, and it, it, in one case, uh, uh, sort of in late 2020, uh, Zambia, who we'd identified as having probably the highest proportion of, of private sector loans, about 60%, um, was, was really now at the edge of, of debt crisis uh, and actually asked its creditors for an extension and a re renegotiation of its debt payments. Uh, but, the, but the creditors refused and Zambia went into default. Uh, and the, as a result, there were cuts to uh, public services, cuts to healthcare spending and uh, the kind of uh, investment in nurses ICU beds, even sort of hospital ventilators. Uh, and remember, this is still kind of uh, only one year into the pandemic. Um, also huge cuts to social uh, sort of spending and welfare and even kind of water and sanitation and education policies as well. Um, so, so we thought this was a really important case to bring to the public's attention, but also one where we could highlight the... Uh, you, I suppose to a degree the kind of moral bankruptcy of, of the case of some of the, these creditors um, and, and Zambia's biggest bond holder actually is a company called BlackRock um, I'm never quite sure whether people will have heard of BlackRock uh, but it's a huge I mean, I've maybe mentioned them before in these meetings previously um, but they're a, a vastly influential company that don't have a huge public profile really uh, but they manage about ten trillion dollars in wealth around around the globe, and they're basic, and that's basically more than any other financial institution manages. Um, and they have a lot of political influence in the US as well. Uh, their, kind of, their CEO uh, Larry Fink has talked a lot about responsible investment, about making capitalism kind of sustainable and ethically responsible, and particularly switching uh, investments to make sure that BlackRock's not financing climate change in financing fossil fuel projects um, and but despite all those warm words in the case of kind of Zambia obviously black, what BlackRock's doing is is not sustainable uh, and it's not very ethically uh, sustainable at all um, so we we've tried to build this campaign over a number of months uh, we've done webinars with uh, oh, I, I should say actually as well another big reason why we we decided to campaign in Zambia was that we have allies in Zambian civil society, a kind of group of organizations who were working closely with the government and, and they reached out actually and asked for more international support for this campaign. Uh, so we've tried to build that support with uh, sort of petitions for the UK government. Uh, we created another action where our supporters were writing directly to the, to the CEO of BlackRock, uh, calling for kind of answers to a few questions and, and for them to offer debt relief. Uh, we we hold, held a kind of a demo outside BlackRock uh, in April, uh, which was on their kind of the day of their annual earnings report. Uh, and I think a key thing has just been to draw attention to uh, the impact of this debt on Zambia versus the impact of it on BlackRock. Um, so Zambia's going to end up, well, if, if this was paid back in full, Zambia would pay back basically double the amount that they originally loaned. Uh, so it's about 110% in interest or profit that BlackRock would make from the, the loan. Um, and it's, yeah, a fair portion of, you know, if that money was just returned to Zambia, it's a fair portion, I think about 20 to 40% of sort of national public spending uh, on, uh, on healthcare, sorry, uh, could be kind of invested in. Um, and, you know, to BlackRock, in some ways, this is it really just a rounding error. It, it, doesn't really compare to the kinds of trillions of dollars that they make uh, that they manage. Um, and the other thing is that I mean, just sort of generally over um, 
over the continent. Uh, again, we're sort of still talking about much of the continent looking for COVID vaccines and trying to invest in healthcare. Um, the amount that African governments paid to these banks and these creditors uh, each year uh, would have kind of vaccinated the continent three times over, um, which I think you know just shows you the scale of the kind of profit making that's that's continued to still happen and why we need to take a stand against it. Um, so and the stage we're at now, uh, Zambia and Blackwater are actually just about going into negotiations. Uh, there's been some initial talks, um, but uh, yeah, they're, they're taking a bit longer than we expected. There's quite a lot of pressure now on BlackRock from all sides. We, we've kind of been working with MPs uh, in the Labour Party and a few backbench conservatives actually as well, just to raise questions and and sort of make sure that BlackRock's name has been associated with this debt in the press and in Parliament. Uh, and there was a, a really good uh, kind of session uh, in the International Development Committee a couple of weeks ago in Parliament uh, where this was discussed and, and actually the committee invited BlackRock to come and answer questions about Zambia's debt, but they refused to appear. Um, and that's kind of been uh, a trend really so far. BlackRock has refused to answer any of our questions. They've not really responded to, to our kind of actions in public uh, and they want to keep a low profile on this and uh, keep it out of the news. Uh, so we're just trying to do everything we can at the minute to kind of make sure it does get to the news. Uh, they've got kind of more earnings and reports coming out this month, uh, which we'll try and try to um, link to Zambia's debt. I think we're trying to work with some faith leaders about uh, possibly making a call from them to uh, for BlackRock to cancel a debt. Uh, and yeah, just really trying to use any avenue we can to, to try and increase the pressure on them and, and get some justice for the Zambian people. Um, that being said, it's, this is not just kind of about Zambia at all. Um, there were, I think, the last estimate about 54 countries uh, technically in debt crisis, which uh, means that their debt payments are unsustainable. Uh, only a few of them have actually defaulted and stopped making those payments. But you might have heard in recent weeks there's been kind of huge protests in Sri Lanka uh, and, and the country's actually now been, uh, the government's been declared bankrupt uh, and in Ghana. And the, the economic situation in both those countries is uh, deeply tied to, to the debt, and particularly debt owed to private banks. So I kind of, our argument is that if we can increase the pressure enough on BlackRock to offer some debt cancellation, um, then it, it hopefully pays the way for other countries to, to get similar successes with their creditors later in the year as well. Um, but I'll stop there uh, in case anyone has any questions. Brilliant, Daniel. Thank you so much. I mean, that, that, that was a fantastic overview of how the debt, the debt uh, economic system actually operates in real life uh, and affects you know, ordinary people, particularly poor people, in the most devastating ways. It's be, that's a really useful kind of uh, basis on which I'll begin to look at why it does that. You know, I'm going to try and do this in 20 minutes. I'm going to be looking at why I forget that thoughts in Jubilee. And my view is going to kind of like how debt operates, a very, and I emphasis on very brief history of debt, Kind of how Jesus dealt with debt, and that leads us on to the beginnings, if you like, of, uh, of the theology of debt and some alternatives to the system itself, because I think that's really what we're going to need given the climate emergency. We're going to have to have alternatives to the, the actual system on which our economics are, are predicated and we just assume are normal. Uh, if that looks a bit scary, let me just uh, go through it one, one bullet point at a time. Just to begin with saying that most forms of money that we use today are based on debt. In other words, debt is the foundation of the monetary system itself. You can't really have money. All money, if you like, is an IOU. So it's in the debt. You owe somebody something, and that little chip that says, well, I owe somebody gets passed around, and that's how the system develops. Uh, just to say that historically, debt has always been a tool of control. This is really vital to understand. Uh, it's, it's not just a natural phenomenon. It's not a, it's not a, um, a rule of nature or, you know, or it's, it's a tool of control by, by powerful to control uh, the, the less powerful. Uh, and so I like to say that debt, debt is the root of all money. Uh, of course, if money is the root of all evil, then debt is the root of all money. The original debt, in other words, once you begin a debt system, you, you, you actually issue a debt called the original debt. The Bible calls that original sin, interestingly enough. The original debt. Actually, you can never really repay that origin without actually destroying the entire system. So when governments talk about repaying their, their debt, they, they're actually either not very good economists, they don't understand how it works, 
uh, or, or they've confused a household debt with a, with a national debt. You can't actually ever pay it back without destroying the system. Uh, debt operates by placing a wall, if you like, around resources. In other words, it creates artificial scarcity out of God's abundance. I know we've creeped into some theology over there, but if God gives us abundance, debt comes along and creates an artificial scarcity in order to control the resource. Debt is designed, why do they do that? Well, it's designed to shift the wealth from the margins up to the center or from the bottom to the top, whatever, whatever image you want to use. Default on debt is actually part and parcel of the system. Default is actually, I, I didn't know this. It's, you, default is automatic once you have a debt system. Otherwise it wouldn't work. So somebody is gonna lose in this game of musical chairs uh, we call uh, economics. Inequality, poverty, foreclosures, this is to do with defaults, loss of land, loss of wealth, and slavery are, and I, and I emphasize, are inevitable under the, under the debt system. They are, they are inevitable, and I'll, I'll explain why that is in a minute. Debt has become rooted in our language, in our religions, in our assumptions, in our systems of government, and I could do a whole um, uh, thesis on, on how debt is rooted in our language, in our religion, and you know, God forgave our sins. That original forgiveness is about guilt, which is the uh, root word. It's the same as chelt or gilda. Uh, and these are words for, uh, uh, for, for money, of course. So there's a whole philosophy uh, around how debt is rooted in our religions and our assumptions to the point that we don't even recognize debt as the root of all of these things um, anymore. Uh, very briefly, well, where did this thing come from? So kind of uh, David Graeber is really helpful in, in his the uh, lecturer at the London School of Economics has got a brilliant book called Debt the First 5,000 Years. So it was invented about 5,000 years in the early city state empires, the Akkadian, the Persian, the Babylonian, the little symbol over there. And it was created as credit was required by uh, traders going off from far away. They, 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 they couldn't pay for the goods they needed to go off by camels and whatever the case is. And, and so they were given credit. And this is, and of course, the very first, the very first writing we have are these or these debt notes, you know, on, on, on tablets and all sorts of things to say, well, you owe me so much. And by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to put some interest on that so you owe me even more. Uh, but the, as a result of the system that was set up, you know, very slowly over these 5,000 years, the owners of the debt became very powerful because the money was coming to them very quickly. That's how it works. Uh, and so the king and the emperor of these city states realized that there was a problem and had to find ways to limit the power of these newly minted oligarchs. And of course, I'm using a term now that they wouldn't have used then, but these people were very powerful. Um, uh, they were adding, the Bible says they were adding field unto field, and, um, and the king had to discipline them. So he, normally he, always a he, I suppose, introduced the Jubilee, it became vital for the king. This wasn't a, a kind thing for ordinary people. This was to protect his power. Why? Because they understood mathematics. They understood that, um, um, that, that um, the, 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 the exponential growth means that the debt is always, the amount of money that you owe is always going to grow faster than your ability to make money or to convert the commons into, into, into some sort of uh, commodity in order to pay it off. In other words, debt grows at an insane rate. And that means that the owners of the debt become rich very quickly. The king had to bring a jubilee in in order to control and to protect his power. So every seven or 20 years, the king would declare something called an amarga, which means back to the mother originally, uh, or a clean slate, uh, other known as a jubilee. And, and actually, it wasn't every seven years that the Bible seems to suggest, but actually whenever the king decided to do it, actually, um, they had that sort of power. Uh, and that would then create at least some form of, of, of equality. And there's a book by Michael Hudson on, on, on that that you can read if you want to do more. So our current economic system is actually predicated on the classical period, the Greek and the Romans, not the earlier Babylonian period. And what is the problem with that? Well, well now the oligarch is it becomes too powerful that the king was now going to them to fund his wars. And so that meant that he didn't have the power anymore to, 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 to declare a jubilee, to try and create some form of equality. Uh, and, and, and the upshot of that is actually jubilees don't really work uh, unless you have a very powerful autocratic king who's able to take on uh, the rich and powerful. And of course, today, people like Boris Johnson don't have the power to do that. They are, in fact, the servants, not of us, but the servants of these very powerful owners of BlackRock and these sorts of things. They are put into power 
for their interests, not ours. And that, that of course, is across the world and has been for at least 2,000 years. And so today's economic reality, we've just heard a really great overview of how that system ends up uh, doing what it does. Debt repayment has become a moral imperative. And, and actually, Daniel actually touched on that very brilliantly. Uh, surely you, you have a moral duty to pay the debt if you go into it. And actually, David Graeber disputes that. Actually, if debts were always going to be paid, the system would collapse. There has to be an element of actually this might not be paid because that means that then the, the people that, that hand out the debt have, a, a, have a, some responsibility to make sure that they're not giving it to people that can't pay. Uh, but the pressure to pay back the original debt, which, remember, is growing at this exponential rate, always increases. So that then spurs on economic development. It increases the monetization of, in other words, what was previously shared amongst us free. So education used to be free, housing used to be free, food used to be free, entertainment used to be free, our life together used to be free. All that no longer remains in the commons. It then becomes commodified. It becomes privatized. It becomes, therefore, um, valuable under this monetary system. It can then be traded uh, and, 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 and uh, for uh, in order to, and the reason it's not so much greed, but this pressure to pay back debt uh, that ensures uh, the upward flow of wealth, that normalizes boom and bust economics. We don't even think about it. And the result of that, of course, is we strip mine the commons. We, we, um, we force the commons, this picture over here, what used to belong to God, now comes under the monetary system, and we, we are forced to cut it all down, like the forests in, 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 in the Amazon. The Amazon is not safe because it's valuable to Bolsonaro. He, he cuts it down in order to make money, in order to put cows and soya there, uh, because that's far more lucrative than leaving an ancient forest in place. And that is a result of the monetary system, this debt mining system. So strip mining of the commons is a, is a term that I, I got from Charles Eisenstein. Uh, nothing is safe. and uh, Everything becomes um, unsacred, if you like. Everything becomes profane under the monetary system. Uh, hence Jesus' uh, phrase, you can either serve God or mammon, but you actually can't serve both. You can't actually try and have two gods in this matter. Professor Stuart Scott has an interesting phrase that I really enjoy. Money is a virus of the mind that uses humanity for its own reproduction, turning the natural world into itself as fast as it can. The reason why it turns the natural world into itself, which is money, is because it needs to pay back that original debt. So that's a really brief overview of the debt system. <laughs> So uh, I'm, I'm actually not going to go into great other rooms at the moment. I'm just going to run through very quickly what Jesus said about money. Um, and I'm going to start with the Jesus' prayer, um, which is originally right, the prayer that we, we, we say today in church is not the original. That, that's, that's many years of, of. But the original, the original phraseology from pre-Q, if you like, is this Abba. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us the debts we owe to others as we forgive all debts owed to us. So that's the subversion of the debt monetary system right there. Lead us not into temptation, i.e. to use the debt system and save us from the evil banker system or the money lending system. That then is one interpretation. It may not be right, but I think this is. Debt's original, Jesus' original prayer to his church was about subverting the debt system and not getting caught up in it. Uh, and yet today we could argue that we have lost that original meaning of that prayer and we are thoroughly caught up in the debt system, all of us today. Um, and this, this is a bit of theology around um, uh, empire and religion. This, uh, this is the empire system that is hierarchical. You know, if you, uh, the king at the top or the pharaoh or the god figure, remember the head is always a representative of God uh, and that group of people over there are the next best. And so, I mean, ordinary citizens, farmers, traders, craftspeople, we all uphold the system. Here I sit over here, I'm the priest because I give a blessing to the system as the priesthood. Uh, the military, of course, are looking inwards. Their job is to prevent these people from rising up and overthrowing the system. They're not looking outwards to protect the system. They're, they're there to protect the king and the royal family effectively. We see the same thing with policing today. If there are any problems with the Occupy movement, they clear out the protesters to protect the bankers. You know, they're not there to protect ordinary people. We know that. That's, that's the system right there. 
Um, and this is what God origi originally intended. We're not supposed to be monetizing the commons. We're supposed to be li living in equality. Uh, the monetary system comes along, puts a wall around the resources. You've got the army to keep the poor people out. And these people think God is very good, of course, because God has been, you know, and these guys have to line up for their labor. They used to have the apples for free. Now they've got to pay for them through their labor. So that's, that's how the debt system comes along and reorders God's abundance with this artificial scarcity share. That's how the debt system works. And we can begin to uh, create a theology of debt around that. Whereas our book is, is somebody that's done a lot of work on the origin, the origin, the origins of the word ecclesia, which is church, actually means that community that has come out of the debt system, come out of empire, come out of the hierarchy, come out of the um, 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 the systems of domination. So, suppose, what, what sort of time do we have now? I don't know where my phone is. Uh, Suzanne, where are we with time? It's uh, twenty to three. Okay.